When we take image generation models, such as stable diffusion, the quality of the image generated is mind-blowing. The output, however, is pretty much controlled by text input, which is a prompt. Text inputs are quite limited in their ability to control the output. For example, if I want to generate an image of a man standing in this pose, I cannot imagine how many words we need to say to explain or define this pose. But if we can simply feed this pose directly to the model, then it makes our job much easier. And if we can feed a text prompt along with this pose, then we have even better control and we can generate the image of a, say, a chef standing in the same pose. Now this problem of precisely controlling the spatial layout of generated images through input images is what is addressed by ControlNet. The inputs could be sketches, normal maps, depth maps, edges, segmentation masks, or even human pose. No wonder ControlNet got the prestigious MAR prize for the work in the ICCV conference 2023. And the impact on the community can be already felt by over 730 citations to this paper. So in this video, let's look at the ControlNet architecture, the zero initialization technique, the qualitative results along with some ablation studies. So without further ado, let's get started. We all know that neural networks are composed of several neural network blocks. For example, if you take the famous ResNet, it has several ResNet blocks in sequence. Similarly, the now famous Transformers has a sequence of multi-headed attention blocks. To understand the control net architecture, let's consider a single block of any neural network from a generative model, say stable diffusion. It typically takes a three-dimensional tensor with height, width, and the number of channels as input, and outputs a similar dimensional tensor. To add control to this block, we first make a copy of the weights and freeze the actual weights. This trainable copy is then connected to zero convolutions and the output of zero convolutions is sent back as input to the frozen block. So whenever we train this model, it's this trainable copy that gets updated, but the actual pre-trained generated model remains frozen. Scaling up this idea to stable diffusion, which has encoder and decoder layers, the block in blue are the trainable copies of the encoder layers. The output of each of these blocks is put through the zero convolutions, which in turn are fed into the stable diffusion decoder blocks. Now one more place where zero convolutions are used is when we take the input conditioning, such as the depth map or the pose, and combine them with the input representation ZT. Talking of zero convolutions, these are simple one-by-one -one convolution layers whose weights and biases are initialized to zero. The conditioning inputs, which are edge maps or poses, have a typical dimension of 512 by 512, which proves to be very high for these one by one convolution layers. So to overcome this, a tiny neural network with four convolution layers is introduced, which converts these images from the image conditioning space CI to the feature space CF, thereby reducing the dimension to 64 by 64. All that it means is that the dimension of the conditioning is small enough to be happily used by the zero convolutions. So that was about converting the input conditioning image to the feature space CF. But whenever there are text prompts, CT, as conditioning inputs, they are taken care of by clip encoders, along with the position encoding for time, and 
are fed directly to the frozen weights of the model. Moving on to how this setup is trained. When training ControlNet, we would like to introduce image prompts instead of text prompts to shift the control from text to image prompts. So we deliberately replace half the text prompts in the training data with empty strings. So that network is now forced to learn the semantics of the conditioning images, such as the edges or the poses or the depth. Training this way, the model abruptly succeeds in following the input conditioning image, usually in less than 10,000 optimization steps. And this phenomenon is referred to as the sudden convergence phenomenon. For example, we can notice that around step 6100, though the output is an apple, the spatial layout of this apple is quite different from that of the input edge conditioning in the test image. But suddenly after 8,000 steps or so, we can see the spatial semantics is obeyed to the dot. And at 12,000 steps, it's only going to get better at matching the semantics of the input image prompt. With that trained model, if we move on to inference, ControlNet introduces what is called classifier-free guidance resolution weighting. Now that's a mouthful, so let's break it down and start from classifier guidance, then move on to classifier-free guidance, and then resolution weighting. To understand classifier guidance, let's get slightly mathematical and begin with the well-known Bayes theorem. By simply applying log to this equation, we can convert multiplications to additions and divisions to subtractions. So the modified equation becomes like this. And lastly, assuming that the distribution of the labels P of Y is trivial, or if we take them for granted, we can set it to zero. And so we arrive at this simplified equation. Let's break this down to see what each of the terms represents. The rightmost term is simply the distribution of the input data X. In other words, it's a generative model because if we simply sample from this distribution of X, we can get outputs similar to that of X. The middle term represents a discriminative classifier as it says, given an input X, give me the probability of class Y. Now the leftmost term is the conditional generative model as it says, given a label Y, give me a generated sample X from the distribution. So long story short, by simply adding a classifier to the generative model, we get a conditional generative model. And now this is the exact idea of classifier guidance. But one of the drawbacks of this classifier is that it needs to be trained with noisy input. Why? Because the input to the diffusion model is noise. And so the classifier needs to take the noise and classify what class that noise belongs to. The solution to this problem, however, is to get rid of the classifier altogether and arrive at a classifier-free guidance. We get rid of the classifier by the idea of conditioning dropout. So we train a conditional diffusion model, such as a stable diffusion, with and without the conditioning labels Y. And we strike a balance between the two using a weighting factor, say beta. And we set it in such a way that the conditioning Y is removed about 20% of the times. Now papers like Glide from OpenAI use this idea of classifier free guidance to generate images like these for an input prompt, say, a stained glass window of panda eating bamboo. And going back to control nets, control net refines this idea into classifier free guidance resolution weighting. Now, because control net has two networks, 
the diffusion model and its train copy, the control net, whenever we have a conditioning image, say an edge map, we introduce additional weights that are multiplied at the connections between the diffusion model and the control net so that the output is much more refined. Now these weights are not neural network weights but simple numbers which are multiplied at each stage. The weights are inversely proportional to the size of the blocks we are connecting into. For example, when the block size is 8 by 8, the weight is 1 by 8. And if the block size is 64, then the weight is 1 by 64. Clearly, the results indicate that by using this resolution weighting, shown by the image on the right as full without prompt, we are getting best results compared to being generated without the weighted guidance. Now with those results, let's look into some ablation studies. Now in terms of ablation studies, they branch off into two and study the effect of network initialization on the one side and the input prompt setting on the other. So for initialization, the try standard initialization of the weights with a Gaussian instead of uh, zero convolutions. Row B is the result of using Gaussian initialization and the quality of images is clearly worse than using zero convolutions. Similarly, the trainer lightweight version of control net, which they call control net light, by replacing the copy of the weights with simple convolutions to see if the control net can be a lightweight network. Thirdly, they also try changing the prompting scenarios, such as no prompt, insufficient prompt, and conflicting prompts. And in all scenarios, ControlNet manages to generate meaningful images rather than just collapsing. They also study the dataset size that is needed to train ControlNet and show that even though we can get reasonable outputs with just 1,000 images, we can see that with a lot more images, say 50,000, the results look better. And as we get closer to 3 million, it gets even better. Lastly, ControlNet is not just restricted to a stable diffusion. It can also be applied to other generative models like Cosmic Diffusion and Protogen. So to wrap things up, these are the variety of control images you can provide as input along with the generated images for each of them. It includes sketches, normal maps, depth maps, edges, and human posts. With that, I think I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to say about control net. Hope that gives enough insight about control nets, and I hope to see you in my next video. Till then, take care.